G'day, I'm not going to tell you too many journalistic war stories today. I'm actually going to try and talk to you about research. So I can truly say that I am a journalist and I am here to help you. Um, now, some of you are long-time Canberrians, but I know that some of you have only just come to our fair city. Um, so I'd like to offer you, the newcomers, a special hello to Canberra. Um, welcome to our place, especially to the ANU in Canberra. And I'm sure, as researchers and uh, thinkers here, you're going to have a wonderful time. Uh, Canberra, in fact, is so confident of its own special charms that we keep a store of the quotes of those who don't quite get Canberra. Uh, my favourite, I think, is still that of the US travel writer Bill Bryson, who spent a wet winter weekend in Canberra. And at the end of it, Bill said that the slogan on the ACT number plate should be, Canberra, why wait for death? <laughs> uh, another American effort I like was the New York Times correspondent, uh, David Sanger, who wrote a 1,500-word piece about uh, George Bush dotting around the Asia-Pacific in 2003. Uh, and this 1,500 words went through... Uh, what the president was going to do in Japan, the Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia. And finally, at the very end, he had one paragraph left for Australia. And David disposed of Australia with this zinger. Past presidents have taken in the sleek restaurants of Sydney or the natural wonders of Australia, not George Bush. He cut the trip down to a visit to Canberra, a capital that is a bit like Ottawa, but not quite as vibrant. And you have to have been to Ottawa to know what a put down that is. <laughs> the best effort, though, is by our own Barry Humphreys, who opined that the nicest thing about living in Canberra is that within a couple of hours of leaving, you can be somewhere interesting. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I invite you, you new Canberra <coughs> residents, to enjoy such put downs because you are going to be here long enough uh, to find the many subtle pleasures that Canberra has to offer, not least here at the ANU. Now, I first came to this campus in 1977. I was here uh, as a radio journalist to cover a conference and do some interviews at the Coombs Building, which still stands. And I have done so many interviews over the years at the Catacombs that I can actually find my way around the maze of that building. You will have graduated from the ANU if you can actually find your way around the, the Coombs Building. Now, <clears throat> during my several periods in the Parliamentary Press Gallery, I came over here on the interview pilgrimage hundreds of times. Uh, now, to you, they are professors or lecturers or tutors or uh, supervisors. To me, in the media, they are talent. Uh, they are the talent wheeled out before the microphone or paraded in the op-ed pages and quoted in the analysis pieces. And after I'd been coming to the ANU for many moons, interviewing talent, it suddenly occurred to me one day that I'd actually gathered for myself a world-class education. Um, if I wanted to talk about defence issues, well, I'd come over and I'd thrust a microphone at Robert O'Neill or Des Ball or Coral Bell or Ross Babbage or Paul Dibb or Hugh White. Uh, economics, well, that's easy. I'll just zip over and have a chat to, uh, Ross, uh, to uh, Ross Garno or Hal Hill or Peter McCauley. Now, if I need Japan or APEC or the regional economies, well, that's all, that's all in Peter Drysdale's brain. I'll just go and talk to Peter. Uh, Indonesia, cornucopia. Uh, Jamie Mackey, Harold Crouch, James Fox. Uh, foreign policy, well, they're all there at the Headley Bull Building, uh, Stuart Harris and many more. Amin Saikal uh, taught me a lot about the Middle East. And we also exchanged views over the years on bringing up daughters or as we eventually realised how they were re-educating us. It is, a it is a universal truth known to all men that any man with daughters does not lack for advice on attire or behaviour. <laughs> now, in the South Pacific, my contact book bulges. Bridge Lyle, Greg Fryer, Stuart Firth, Satish Chand, Ron May. Uh, when he retired, actually, Donald Danoon said that the Coombs building might actually be one of the structural problems confronting the South Pacific. But that is, <laughs> that is an argument for another day. Uh, and now, among the many Asian specialists at the ANU, uh, I learned a lot in the early days 
from one of the great men of Asia, Professor Wang Gungwu. Uh, particularly Wang Gu's uh, argument that in our relations with Asia, it's Australia's differences that actually make Australia valuable to the region. And I'll quote him. Paradoxically, what Australians value about their culture, the law, the respect for human rights, the parliamentary system, which are not features of Asian society, these are what attract Asians, which I always thought was an interesting perspective. And I remind him of that whenever I go back to Singapore. I must say that when I finally got around to actually doing a degree at this place, an MA, I actually felt quite disadvantaged because uh, rather than having on one tutorials with all these guys, I had to share them with the other students at the time, so I thought I was actually being disadvantaged. Anyway, enough for the advertisement. My job is to try to talk to you about research. Now, as someone who's spent his whole life in daily journalism, this presents some problems. In his first of this lecture series about research, Hugh White talked to you about the contemplative scholarly life and the scholarly virtues of seeking the evidence, being impartial, being truthful and tolerant of the views of others, um, all those things you find in the Murdoch press every day. Um, <laughs> now, journalism can aspire to those goals, but the harsh reality is that we are governed by, of course, the tyranny of deadlines. So we achieve those higher ideals piece by piece, one edition at a time. As an editor of mine <coughs> once remarked, only half joking, ignorance is no barrier to journalism. <laughs> so as the deadlines approach, we take what facts and quotes we have and we file. And the old wire service joke is, it was right when I filed it, which means that an hour later, when more facts emerge, discrediting or changing what you just wrote, well, you file a replace story and start again. So in thinking about this concept and this idea, this practice of research, I turned to one of my favourite historians, Barbara Tuchman, who is also a wonderful writer. She is noteworthy for having worked as both a journalist and as an historian without having specialist qualifications in either discipline. And so, if I point you to nothing else, I would recommend that you get hold of Barbara Tuchman's How to Do It book on research and writing called Practicing History. If all this session does is send you off to read Barbara Tuchman on research, then your hour is well spent. Now, Tuchman, as I say, started in journalism on the American newspaper, The Nation, and describes her reporting this way. Quote, collect the relevant facts, condense the subject into 200 words, incorporating the nation's view, and have it ready on time. This experience was invaluable, even if the pieces were ephemeral, unquote. Valuable if ephemeral. Welcome to journalism. Tuchman realised her vocation was history, not journalism, when a few years later an editor admonished her for spending too much time gathering raw material. Quote, said the editor, you can turn out the job much faster if you don't know too much. <laughs> a working motto for journalists, but I suggest death for you researchers. In Practicing History, Tuchman relates the wonderful story of a lady professor she met in the Documents Archive in Washington. This professor had been doing research on relations between the United States and Mo Morocco all her life. By this time, the professor was in her 70s, had recently suffered a heart attack, but had not reached a cutoff point for her research. She was yet to produce the definitive work on US-Morocco relations because there were so many fascinating areas still to be researched. Having told this cautionary story, Tuchman then makes the point that I will use as the centrepiece of what I want to say to you about research. Now, here is the quote. And the key point in it, as you will read through it, is, of course, Tuchman's point that research is endlessly seductive 
writing is hard work. Now, the quote is wonderful, but I think it unwittingly, in isolation, sets up a false dichotomy between research and writing. Tuchman herself <coughs> makes that clear in her book. As she researched, she constantly passed the material through the grinder of her mind and immediately wrote down the product of that process, the quotes, the thoughts, the questions, the insights, on small index cards that she carried constantly in her handbag. As the shape, the spine of the research emerged from the mist, these cards were arranged in chapter order in a shoebox. When the shoebox was full, the ingredients of the book were ready to be cooked. And you have something more magic than a shoebox. You have a computer. So here via Tuchman is the fundam fundamental thought I really want to talk to you about today. Never forget that the central purpose of what you're doing, of the research that you're working on, is the writing, not the research. That without the writing to pass it on, the research might as well not exist. The way to avoid writer's block is never to formally start writing. <laughs> By that I mean, you put words on paper, you hit the writing road almost before you start thinking. <coughs> so the moment you begin, you start by writing, by putting down questions or thoughts or whatever. And be comfortable with the fact that you are most unlikely at that point to have any idea about the eventual shape or end point of where that writing will take you. As the writing spreads and gets denser and as your research develops, be confident that that first set of scribblings will grow, that your questions eventually will become chapter headings. Inspiration does not strike. It is built brick by brick and those bricks are your words. The writing is the central bit. The research merely feeds it. And what drives the research is the thinking. Now, the, the thinking is that most mysterious, most mysterious of process where you pass the material through the grinder of your mind and you crystallise it in your words and you write it down. And as you crystallise, you lay down more bricks and on the good days, the structure drives itself. Okay, as you sit there, this is all well and good. How does this help me do what I need to do, the writing for the thesis or the project or the book or whatever. Now, you are in luck. I'm a journalist, so I'm here to help you. And I want to give you a series of things. I want to give you a mantra. I want to give you a visual image, a matrix. And then I want to give you some commandments on how to operate the method. Like I said, I'm a journalist, so it's all very simple. So let's talk about the writing. First of all, there is nothing magical about the act of writing. The product can be magic. The actual process is prosaic. It is simple. At one level, writing is mechanical. If journalists can do it every day to deadline, come hell or hangover, then clearly it is mechanical, not mystical. Writing is a muscle. You use it every day and it gets stronger. And here's a circular proposition. To write, you just have to sit down and stay on that chair until you write something. And then you come back the next day and do it again. That is Hemingway's promise, that is Tuchman's promise, that is, I think, every writer who's ever tried to describe this funny act about how you do it. It may be laborious, it may be agony, but if you keep doing it, the muscle will grow. 
and eventually you will be surprised at the weight of the ideas you can lift. There is no such thing as writer's block, I promise you. Let us call the problem for what it is. It is not blockage, it's not laziness, or not too much laziness. It's not about distraction, it's not about the pull of other business. The problem is always the same. It is fear. Fear of failure, the fear of disappointment, disappointing yourself, disappointing others, the fear that you may have wasted all that time and effort, um, the fear that what's on the page isn't good enough, the fear that you cannot capture the image you have in your head and get it down. Be comforted by the fact and the knowledge that everyone who has ever tried to write something new has tasted that fear. And to overcome the fear, as I said, I offer you the mantra. And here it is. Very simple. So, to research is to write, to think is to write, to think clearly is to write clearly, which is very important. To decide, to choose is to write. And trust yourself and trust your writing and you will find the answers. And as the little thing says, the sun will come up. Now, the first couple of lines are about, if you like, the mechanical instructions. The last two lines are about overcoming the fear. You may feel lost with no idea where the research and the writing are taking you, but if you keep laying down those bricks, those words, you keep revising and re rearranging and trying to crystallise what your thoughts are driving towards, eventually the shape of the structure and its crowning point will emerge from the mist. Trust yourself and trust your writing from the mechanical, the magic will emerge. It always happens. Now, not only am I giving you the mantra, there is also a visual image. Starting off in newspapers, I moved into radio and then <coughs> eventually into television. And I am a words man, but television is a most humbling experience for a words man because you learn that images can do more directly than words and often with more power. So over the years, I've developed the understanding that if I'm going to tell people things, I've got to give them a picture. And I really learned that dealing with the military. Over the years, I've done a lot of presentations to Australian military officers about the war between the media and the military. Oh, media military relations, it's called. <laughs> now, learning from that humbling by the TV God, I always, in those lectures to officers, include in my speech a diagram showing the rather complex relationship between the media, the military and politicians. And, and the truth of the diagram is that the military hate the politicians more than they hate the media, but they're only allowed to be nasty to the media. But anyway, that's it. And the really humbling thing is that as I've met military officers over the years since, they never remember a word that I said, but they always remember the diagram. So, here is your matrix. This is, if you like, a visual description of what I'm trying to tell you. Now, like most diagrams, it carries its own logic. The writing, obviously, is at the centre, and the writing feeds into and draws from all the other stages. And you'll notice that I've tried to separate out and to make different or separate steps what is, in reality, a continuum, a process that just keeps re repeating and refining itself. Um, so there, there are, this is in many ways an artificial division, uh, as you know. Your brain doesn't actually compartmentalise like that. The aim of this thing is to try to represent a continuum, a process. So it starts, as we say, with a few questions and a couple of words and a bit of paper or a computer, and you crank it up. You crank this process up, and you keep it rolling and you keep repeating it, and at the other end, out pops an article, a thesis, a book, voila. 
The mind is magic. So, the writing is the centre and it is the axle and it's everything revolving around it. And this cycle repeats and refines again and again. And so there you have it. You have your mantra, you have your matrix. Now, to give you the rules. Call these the commandments. Or, to be a little bit more modest, call them the tricks. Number one, as you'll imagine, is the prime directive. And as I say, once you get the habit, once you actually keep doing it day after day again and again, this actually becomes pretty easy. The writing muscle gets stronger. I promise you, the more you use it, the more you do it, you get better at it. Rule two, though, rule two never gets easy. The most brutal way to express what that rule is about is to say that really you have to be ready as you take up your pen or your delete button, you have to be ready to kill your babies. Things that you thought were brilliant and essential and wonderfully written turn out to be wrong or misleading or they just are surplus to the main game. They get in the way of what you eventually decide you're driving towards. They have to go. And this is one of the hardest things to do. Something that you've laboured over to cut it out because it doesn't work. To discard what is unnecessary requires courage and work. It takes time. It takes time to do this. Um, and I offer you Pascal's apology on the letter he wrote to a friend. I am sorry to have wearied you with so long a letter, but I did not have time to write you a short one. Selection is what determines the ultimate product. What you put in, what you take out. What you delete matters because it heightens what you leave in. There are also issues of honesty there too about what you select and what you select out. Consider this from Sir Paul Hasluck, a successful politician, perhaps even a better writer, describing how one of our greatest politicians and speakers, Robert Menzies, would prepare a major speech. <coughs> Quote, Menzies revised the typescript two or three times, mainly cutting out. On one occasion, when suggesting to me that I delete a paragraph from a speech that I had shown him before delivery, he said, it is a clever paragraph. It would give you a great deal of pleasure to deliver it. But is that momentary pleasure worth the result? Whenever I have written something that I am rather fond of myself in a speech, I always look at it a second time and generally cut it out. Now this is political and writing discipline of a very high order. It is, in politicians speak, about not giving comfort to your enemy nor injury to your friends. Thankfully, thankfully, many writers cannot bear, cannot bear to kill their brightest babies, even if it causes them, causes them collateral damage. So for instance, um, Henry Kissinger, always wanted to explode in print every verbal firecracker his fertile mind threw up. And as readers, we are better for it. And that's why, perhaps, uh, I enjoy Kissinger more as a writer than I do as a political player. So write, write and rewrite, and then be brutal with what you have left. Now, rule, rule three is actually, seems simple. But it's hard to do. The aim, thinking of the reader, is to communicate, even persuade. And to do that, you have to consider the effect you are reaching for with your words. You need to step back from the struggle you have had in creating and try to look at your words with fresh eyes as someone else. And it's always useful to, of course, get some, a couple of other people to read what you're writing and you'll sometimes be surprised at what they see that you've missed. Read the stuff out loud. Check the rhythm. Check the rhythms, 
and see if it sounds like it makes sense. And of course, following this rule, take out the long words, put in the short words. Take those wonderful ornate five line sentences and do the regular phraser and turn them into three simple sentences that make sense. Rule four. This is the part where you have to trust your writing and trust yourself. We come back to this idea of trusting yourself, trusting what you're doing. You're building the research, you're putting down the words, and as you work, you don't really know the final shape or what the final conclusions will be. Let me offer you a wonderful line from a fine journalist, James Reston, of the New York Times. When the Times was shut down for several weeks because of a printer's strike, Reston was asked if he was enjoying not having to write his regular column. I'm miserable, said Reston. How do I know what I think until I see what I write? He spoke the truth. Now, rules five and rule six, which as these things happen, will follow rule five. Rule five and six actually will seem to crash against each other because rule five is about letting your inquiry go anywhere and rule six is about seeking structure and discipline in your, write, in your writing. But rule five is about letting yourself go, about roaming as freely as you possibly can. The issue of fear that stops you from writing can also stop you from, th from thinking. There are a lot of ways to play the freedom game and I urge you to try. That's partly what university is all about, as is going to the pub too. Do a brainstorm with some of your mates or alternatively go and sit on your own in a room somewhere and spend five minutes staring at the wall thinking about as many ways as you can dream up for dealing with an issue or a problem or a topic. And then write down the stupidest and the slickest and the various other axes that you can come up with. Just play around with the stupidest ideas and the slickest ideas and then put it away for a while. Come back, let your subconscious work on it for a day or so and come back and see what you might have thrown up. There are lots of ways to play the freedom game. But give yourself permission occasionally as you're churning through your research to step right back from it and see if you can think about it in different ways. Now following this, about being free, I immediately give you rule six, which is about not being free. Rule six is about channeling this creative effort into your writing. This is the brick laying at work. You can't really know where you're going until you write it down, of course. And the experts tell us that the act of writing does in fact lay down deep memory. You are more likely to remember something if you write it down and of course your subconscious then has much more to work with. And you have, I come back to this point again, you have to trust this thinking and writing process. You have to let it run. It will eventually give you the answer. Tuchman is good on this. She says that the act of transforming a mass of research into a written narrative eventually forces a why to the surface, an answer, the why. Suddenly, as you're working away, the why, the conclusion, the theory will tap you on the shoulder and you'll wonder why you never saw it before. In Tuchman's words, if you will submit yourself to the material instead of trying to impose yourself on the material, then the material will ultimately speak to you. It will supply the answer. And I'd add to that another part of this approach, that if you set out with a firm conclusion in mind, then don't be surprised if every fact you select automatically supports the conclusion you're striving towards. It's the other side of thinking freely about what you're doing. Now rules 7, 8 and 9, 
I'll give you all of them together. These, these are about, in their various ways, going to the pub rather than going to the library. These are about talking and questioning. And you'll be surprised what important or busy people will actually tell you or give you in terms of time and response if you come at them with beguiling questions and an intelligent interest in what they do. And if you've just got enough tenacity to keep badgering them for a while. What I'm trying to tell you in these series of rules is don't be too confident that the written record always tells you how or why something really happened. Now, politicians and journalists are surrounded by paper and written documents. But in many ways, politicians and journalists actually operate in an oral culture. The really important stuff often in politics is done by word of mouth and the paper comes afterwards to express in formal terms, to justify in formal terms, what has actually been informally decided. In terms of this oral culture, let me give you three rules of politics, which most journalists in the press gallery here and most journalists around the world covering politics, I think, would intuitively know. Uh, I've heard these rules expressed in several different ways by colleagues over the years, although I must say I've never seen them written down. And these rules of politics state, there is always a deal. It is always personal and always keep your eyes on the money on the table. One of the problems, I think, for, for academics doing politics, I often think this, is that they put too much emphasis on the paper because course, that's what they can trace, that's what they can quote. The bastardry doesn't often get put down on paper. And if you want to follow this thesis, have a look at Mark Latham's diary. Or in an earlier era, it's been forgotten now, I'll have a quick look at Peter Howson's diary for when the Liberals were tearing themselves apart over Gorton and McMahon. It's, a, it's an interesting read about the way the game is played. So it isn't all written down and see if you can sniff out some of that stuff that didn't make it onto paper. And finally, rule 10. When you've spent all that time searching and thinking and agonising, drinking all that coffee, um, you've been writing and editing and refining, don't wimp out. Don't worry about your colleagues and your peers and your professors. Don't die wondering. And don't let the reader die wondering either. You must decide. An old news editor saying, I may be wrong, but I'm never in doubt. <laughs> so, crystallise, choose. Give the reader a firm conclusion. State it with all the force you can muster. Let them know you're in the game. And here endeth the rail. And I conclude with words attributed to Benjamin Franklin. And if he didn't say them, he should have. And these go. Beer, beer, Beer. Beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. And so, researchers, I say unto you, when the research seems far too hard, go to the pub and follow Benjamin Franklin in moderation. <laughs> go well. Now, your questions.
Oh, the diagram, that's much more simple than your diagram. Uh, it's uh, basically, um, oh, media access is, uh, this is because it's a provocative diagram, the media access is truth at one end and untruth at the other. Uh, the, the, media, the, the military axis is death uh, or war and peace and the, um, the politi politics axis is power and unpower. And it actually works in terms of where you, three axes and where you put yourself on the various bits of that. Um, it's actually very much more than that one, a provocative way of getting military people to realise that the real enemy is the people who give them their orders, not the poor journalists who cover them. Um, and... Uh, it, it never works. You know. Years of conditioning, but uh, it's a useful it's a useful device, uh, and uh, I, I really do say, as a words man, um, it is always very humbling to see the power of television, and to realise that the the camera guys and the editors who put it all together, the image people, are so often far more important than the words people. Uh, useful useful corrective. So you should try and get a diagram for whatever you write to. <laughs> and I promise you that's all people will remember. I don't know if you've read Nassim Nicholas Taleb's book, The Black Swan. He's very scathing of uh, journalists, mainly because of uh, what he calls the narrative fallacy, the, the way that people tend to trick themselves into you know, writing a story over a bunch of facts that are not necessarily there. And also the confirmation bias, which I think you mentioned, like, selective choosing of quotes to support your argument. So um, is that the difference between journalism and ideal research? I think the Black Swan is a really interesting work. Um, and I would say, of course, the reason you probably know about it is not just because your professors have told you about it, because journalists have actually publicised the concept quite widely. So uh, even, uh, e even uh, journalists have their uses. I think um, that's what I was trying to say to you about thinking I mean, it's a dreadful, dreadful uh, thing about, you know, thinking outside the box. But um, trying to think freely, uh, trying to think widely, and that's really what Black Swan is all about, this idea that, you know, there, something will come along that's outside the paradigm you think you're working in. Uh, the, I think the point about that, of course, is that a lot of this sort of predictive stuff is not about predicting, but, of course, just opening your mind to different scenarios being able to think about, all right, well, if that changed and that changed, what are my different scenarios going to be? And that is very useful. Um, and, of course, um, just over the last 18 months, um, we have seen a lot of black swans come home to roost in all sorts of areas of uh, the financial universe and other universes. So uh, I think black swans might have gone mainstream. It might be part of the new conventional wisdom um, so that is a problem. Uh, your other problem, and you, you, you allude to it, is of course the, the, the huge attraction that humans have to narrative. I mean, that is the way we, we learn and that is the way we tell each other our stories. It is through narrative. And I don't think you're going to break people of that. That's how we do it. Um, and, that's, and that is always about selection. And that is, I suppose, the honesty issue, isn't it? that in choosing the facts you leave in and, or choosing the things you leave out, how honest you are about what you're trying to do, what you're trying to tell, and whether you've confronted your own blank spots. Um, so this idea of things that will happen outside um, I think is a very useful corrective. Um, and a lot of people have been thinking about this rather extraordinary flock of black swans that have landed on the global economy over the last two years. Graham, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm not a journalist, but I do share some of your interests, uh, beer and pubs. <laughs> um, it was a good, it was uh, a good headline. <laughs> the, uh, which, which, which particular pub, Cam campus pubs, would you recommend as being a good place? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I should put in, I suppose, a, uh, a, a quick ad for the National Press Club. <laughs> there you'll find a particularly erudite uh, quality of drinker. Uh, and if you want to bump into lots of politicians, you might have to sort of force yourself to meander around Marnica and Kingston, which is where all those politicians hang out. 
But, uh, of course, the beauty of Canberra is that you can probably just do as well with a barbecue in the backyard. Graham, your idea conjures up the idea of, of an individual conversation of one-on-one um, -on -one sort of mentality. In this era now of blogs and all that, on the internet and conversations going on that way, which are to some degree less one-on-one, -on -one, how has that changed this notion of going to the pub and getting your information that way? Has there been a marked change? Have you noticed that? No, I don't, I, I don't think people change. And I think that was really, I mean, partly it was just a nice headline to get people to come along. Um, so that's always about grabbing, the, grabbing their attention. That, you know, they won't just come for the lunch, they might come for the speech too. Um, I don't think people change. Uh, I think that's one of the, the glories of history, that if you, if you read history, how much you find yourself in those who've gone before you. Uh, and in terms of the technology... Uh, I have been extraordinarily fortunate as someone who started um, in afternoon newspapers, which are, are dead and di uh, were dying even as I started. Um, but I started in a newspaper where um, if Gothenburg had walked through the door, it would have taken him only half an hour to work out the technology we were using. He hadn't changed, the technology hadn't changed that much. So to go from that to sort of the revolution in the, the sort of series of revolutions in technology that we've gone through, over the last four decades, um, you realise that the technology will just keep changing. The thing that you hang on to, I think, is that people don't change at the same speed. And in terms of journalism or the writing, uh, that doesn't change at all because it's still about the same thing it's always been. What's the most important point? What's the sentence that I start with that will make the reader go on to the second sentence? Uh, and that is the same storytelling, tale-telling problem that we've had ever since we gathered around the fire. So to that extent, um, that insight, those insights about how you write, who you write for, for yourself and for your audience, those insights, I think, will not change. Uh, you might be doing it as a blog or, or whatever, but the, the product itself, the need for it to be true, for it to speak to you and speak to what you've decided and to try and reach out to an audience, um, those are the same impulses that writers have always had. When you talked about the writer's block, you, you talked that it wasn't a block, that it was fear. And as a journalist, you must have asked many people many questions. How, as a new researcher, how do you get over the, or have you got any advice how to get over the fear of question block, not wanting to ask the stupid question. <laughs> yes, yes. That is a good question. Okay, look, it's very easy for someone like me to stand up and say, um, there's no such thing as a stupid question, um, only a stupid answer. I mean, that's what we tell young journalists. Um, I suppose the way around it is to be well grounded. Before you ask your questions, have done so much work that you know the ground. Uh, you don't have to do so much work that you're like the lawyer, the lawyer who never will ask a question in court unless he knows the answer. But you are so well grounded. You know, a good journalist um, will have done a lot of thinking, a lot of research. He might have, um, uh, Paul Lynham, before he did a big television interview, would type out 40, 40 questions. Now, he would only use five or six of them. But that was his, if you like, his, 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 his structure. If he needed to, he could fall back on his questions. Um, so, as a sort of a straight, easy thing, give yourself a list of questions. You know, have questions worked out and written down. And then be, of course, willing to let them go if the interviewer, just interviewee, goes, takes you off in another direction. Um, I learnt my interviewing fear moment. I had my interviewing fear moment not long after I went into radio. I'd been in newspapers for five years. I thought I knew how to do an interview. Uh, I had done a lot of interviews as a newspaper journalist with uh, Bob Hawke in his hangover days. You know, uh, When you did an interview with Bob Hawke early in the morning in Melbourne in those days, you had to be ready to duck. Um, so not long after I'd started in radio, they gave me this great big uh, nagra magnificent machine, the old reel-to-reel -reel Nagras. 
um, and sent me off down to the ACTU to ask Bob Hawke about, um, and this will tell you how long ago this was, uh, the fact that the trade union movement was placing a ban on wheat shipments to Indonesia following the invasion of East Timor. Now I knew the question I wanted to ask him and the question was, by imposing this ban on wheat shipments, are you not interfering in foreign policy, which is the role of the Australian government, which is a good question. So I asked him the question, and Hawkey, in that way he had, sort of one eyebrow went up, the lip curled, and he turned to me and said, well, you could think that, you'd have to be a complete nincompoop, and stopped. Now, I was about to do what I would have done if I'd been a newspaper journalist, still in newspapers. I was about to say something rather nasty like, well, answer the freaking question, or words to that effect. And I was about to do that when I realised, ah, I'm not in newspapers anymore, I'm in radio. I can't swear at the president of the ACTU. And so I stood there with my mouth open. And he smiled, and I, my mouth was still open. And uh, then he turned and walked away. So, the moral of the story is, don't just have the really good first question. The moral of the story is to have the very good second question and third question and fourth question and fifth question so that if he's really nasty that day or she's really nasty that day, you just keep being polite and asking. Uh, and I think that's the secret. The secret is partly to get the access. You've got to be persistent enough and you've got to be confident in your own work. You've got to know that what you're doing is so important that what you produce is so important that this person has got to find time in their busy lives for you. So there's a belief issue. You know, I trust myself, I believe. But when you get in there, you've done so much work that you are able to be confident that you've got enough questions, you know the field well enough that you can challenge them, interest them, cross-examine them. Um, and again, it comes back to that issue of thinking and crystallising. You know, you can ask, you can go in there with 50 questions, but you want to have crystallised in your mind, what is the point? You know, what am I trying to get from this person? That's the other thing about asking questions. Best interviews are never infantry advances. You know, you advance on a two-mile front. Well, you can't do interviews like that. The best interview is a cavalry charge at a particular point. So by all means, have a lot of questions. But the other thing I would say to you about interviewing is before you go in, have crystallised in your mind what you want. You know? And if you've worked out what the point is and where you want to go with it, you won't often lose out. And of course, the other journalist thing is that in an interview, there can only be one person in charge. And ideally, it should be you. Um, and you know, given you've got the microphone and you're setting the questions, it should be you. I'll do the camera in charge. Um, aside from one piece that you wrote last year, what's the hardest piece of writing you've ever done? Ah, oh, um, okay. Um, well, the hardest piece of writing I've done is the, uh, the eulogy for my father. So that's the hardest piece of writing I've done. Um, the hardest piece of writing I've ever done. All right. Um, I think the hardest piece of writing I've ever done was um, covering my first war, which was the, uh, and I did it, in complete comfort. I, I advise you, when you cover your wars, always do them from five-star hotels, okay? So the first war I covered, I covered the, uh, what I call the Malvinas War, the Falklands War. I covered it from Buenos Aires, which was 2,000 kilometres from where the fighting and the dying was going on. So, but the point about this is that what struck me in that period was how inadequate my journalism was to describe to Australians what was going on in Argentina as they lost the war. I realised how limited journalism is to convey the range of human experience. I was describing a military junta that was in the process of falling over, which was true, it was, 
But all the other things that were going on around that political process were extraordinarily interesting and I couldn't really get them into my journalism. Uh, and I know that the moment when I completely and utterly felt that I had no power to communicate was in the middle of this war that the Argentines were losing, uh, Pope John Paul came to visit. And here was this country with a military junta which had no legitimacy, which was losing their war, which had sent their sons to die on this stupid island in the middle of the Atlantic. And here came this strong, vibrant, as he was then, in the early 80s. You know, we, we think of him, John Paul, now as an old man. But in that stage, he was really at his peak. And this whole society just exploded, this Catholic society, for this man as a personification of their Catholicism and their belief and their thoughts about what their society could be. And do you think I could get any of that? Not, not a bit. So um, that was, I think, I, where I realised that uh, sometimes only the poets and the novelists can ever give you the whole range and that journalists only give you very small slices. Um, and in a more general sense, uh, Every time I've tried to, uh, to write about political bastardry, I only get little bits of the political bastardry. Um, just a follow-up. 